Okay, it looks like everybody is starting to populate. Uh, just a quick housekeeping. If you will turn your cameras and mics off, uh, so that way we can have the presenters on and, and no other distractions. So again, cameras and uh, uh, mics, please turn off in the Zoom setting. Great. Give us a few more seconds to let the people start pouring in, and then we'll get started. Okay, well, let's uh, get started. Uh, welcome to our first 2020-2021 school year program. Uh, we are excited about the program that Stantec has to uh, uh, offer us today, and so um, really thankful to them for, for that. Just a couple of housekeeping items to touch on real quickly at the beginning. Uh, my name is Jordan Dial. I'm uh, the current president, but today is my last day serving as the current president of the A4LE North Texas chapter. So here in just a sec, we will make a transition to uh, the new board president. So. Um, Today we are, uh, again, just please remember to keep your mics and cameras off um, uh, for this meeting so that there's no distractions um, uh, throughout the program. That would be really helpful to us. We're gonna stick to this 12 to one time frame. We wanna be respectful to everybody's time. Santex uh, built a program that fits in that time frame uh, and also allows for some Q&A throughout there. So we'll, we'll talk more about that here in a second. Um, and finally, as my last day as the uh, uh, current president of North Texas uh, A4LE, just want to say a big thank you to all of our members for uh, being a member of the organization, helping us to uh, do our best to serve the educational clients we have that are a part of our membership. Uh, obviously, with the times that are upon us, we've had some fun uh, opportunities to do our get creative in how we uh, provide value to our membership. And I want to say a big thank you to our board, a big thank you to our chapter advisors who've given us some advice during this time on how best to uh, uh, care for our membership, provide value for our membership through this time. So obviously the virtual programs are uh, a thing we are all living right now, and uh, we're going to do our best to continue doing it at the highest level. Um, uh, and so we'll do that right now through the end of the year. But uh, excited about today and excited to be able to hand the torch off to Ann Hildenbrand with BRW Architects as our incoming uh, chapter president for the 2021-2020, excuse me, 2020-2021 school year. Uh, and so with that, I will hand it to Ann and uh, let her run with it. So thank you, Ann, for all you've done this past year as the president-elect and looking forward to your leadership this year. Great, thank you so much, Jordan. Much appreciated. I have um, big shoes to fill. So um, as Jordan said, welcome. And we are now passing the torch. We have a new board to, to share with you today. And with that, I would also um, like to um, recognize our new board. As Jordan said, I starting today, I'm your new president, Ann Hilden Brand with BRW Architects. And San Gifa has moved up from past from uh, I'm sorry, from programs first chair to president elect. Welcome, San Gifa, Carthage with Corgan. And now Jordan Dial for the next year will be. Past president, I look forward to seeking out his mentorship throughout this year. And um, Keith Anderson with WRA has stepped up to program's first chair. And our new executive board member is Beverly Fornock with Corgan. She uh, was formerly on the membership at large director position and has now filled this program second chair and then Amy Holsel with Stantec um, and Thomas Campbell with Alpha Consulting Engineer will continue as treasurer and secretary. And this is our board and our chapter advisors. We're very thankful for our chapter advisors um, coming back 
uh, they advise us to keep this um, this chapter relevant and it's much appreciated. We've added Vicki Burris from Fort Worth this year, so we're excited to get her input. Um, and we have a new board member, um, Meredith, I'm sorry, not Meredith, but Meredith has come in as first chair and Logan is now second chair. And our newest board member is Rachel Westmoreland with Glenn Partners. And Jared Boyles has taken over the membership first chair, so we welcome him and support him in that. And Tanya Caudill with Glenn Partners and John Morell with CBRE will continue in fundraising. We have Mike Lissy and Brian Harlan with Impact Award, Greg Estes, Jennifer Norris, and Josh Rogg. They both continue in their uh, previous positions as emerging professionals. And then our newest news is that Oswaldo Rivera Ortiz with Dallas ISD is join joining the board this year to support Roberto Zuniga with the school studio. A uh, great new exciting partnership there. And uh, Josh Miner with HEB ISD will be our chapter advisor board member. So I have two people uh, this year I would like to recognize for their outstanding leadership. If we were in person, I could hand them these awards but I will deliver these awards to you. You can't see them, but um, first is Jordan Dial for his excellence in leadership throughout this year. Um, he's been a great mentor to me this past year. And they're um, big shoes to fill Jordan. And I thank you for what you have done this past year to keep the chapter relevant and always looking for ways to improve and I hope to continue that. Thank you, Anne, very much. And then also, um, someone I have also looked to as a mentor these past four years that we've been on the board together is Sangeetha, so I will deliver this to you at some point in, in person. I think especially challenging year with COVID and um, having to transition to virtual. I think you did a great job keeping these programs relevant and our participants involved. So I wanna thank you for that and look forward to continuing these next few years on the board with you, Sankita. Thank you, Anne. All right, um, our next program is the golf tournament. We have filled all the spots and um, sponsorships. Thank you so much. I believe this is a record year for um, sponsorships. We do have some new times, so please, it's an early check-in of 7 a.m. and an 8 a.m. shotgun start. Um, you will receive breakfast to go so you will be fed while you're here and please note that the time is different from what you've seen before but the shotgun start time is 8 a.m so please note that and we're back at coyote ridge golf club so look forward to seeing you there uh, we have filled all of our programs for the rest of this year and all through next year um, we will be still going virtual. Currently, our holiday party will be um, in person. So look for, we're still finding the right venue to do that. And we will present our impact award winners. Um, please, school districts, please submit for that. Submissions are coming up soon. We are going to extend that submission date. Um, but please get those to us. Uh, we have an exciting COVID discussion panel for January scheduled. And let me go back one. I skipped over this presentation in November, which will be virtual. It's by Perkins and Will. It's, their, uh, it's a new STEM building that they've done. So we're excited to see that virtually. Um, February will be our first in-person 
meeting, this will be VLK Architects, their Crowley ISD BR Johnson Career Tech Center. And then our April Southern Region will be in person in Austin this year in April again. And we also have our Emerging Professionals Bowling Tournament set up for April 15th. And then in May, we'll be visiting um, Allen ISD, and we'll also we'll have two presentations, one by VLK and one by PBK. And then in June, we'll be visiting Woodrow Wilson High School by BRW Architects to learn about acoustics. So please join us for that. And all the remaining ones are on the website. So please take a look there. Um, our August membership has gone down slightly. Um, so please re remember to renew your membership. Super important to continue to do that to support um, our organization. And there's all sorts of different rates available. So please take a look on the website for those. There's discount rates for uh, group rates for students um, and for school districts. And then please join us on social media. We have a great committee. Um, we've added two members to that. So please look out for those for also participating on social media. Also, thank you to our annual sponsors. Um, Interface and Jackson Construction were added for silver, so we have filled all of our 2020 sponsorships. So please go online and secure your 2021 sponsorships. We have a platinum, a gold one available, and four silver sponsorships. All right, without further ado, we'll start our program. Um, this is by Stantec, it's a Highland Park facility. Um, Keith Anderson will be facilitating the question and answer, which will be through the chat room. So please, if you have questions, the way you would ask those is to put them in the chat on the Zoom meeting. He will be facilitating this. It will be interactive, so you can ask a question whenever. And we will, um, we look forward to Stantec's presentation. Uh, we've got Diego, Brett, and Vicki, and I will let them introduce themselves. I'm going to stop sharing here. Thanks, Ann. Uh, we're excited to be here and share with you guys. We, when we submitted this, uh, I guess a couple uh, or, or sometime last year, we were very excited about all of us being at the facility and being able to visit it in person. Uh, a couple of things didn't go as we planned this year, uh, as you guys know, you know, there's a little thing go called COVID. So we'll do as best as we can with what we have. Uh, we, we put together a virtual tour and, and with that, I, I would share that so there's two parts to this uh, to this conversation today that we're sharing with you guys. We'll talk about resilient schools and we'll give specific examples. We'll get a little more specific on storm shelters and on school safety. Uh, and then uh, the, the second half of the presentation uh, will be a virtual tour of, of Boone Elementary. Um, I'm uh, joined today uh, with two, two co-presenters, Vicki and Brett, and I will let them uh, introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Vicki Brown. I'm a senior project architect with Stantec. Um, I've been able to be involved with a lot of the storm shelters uh, in our office. I'm Brett Holsley. I'm the principal in charge, now the principal in charge for Highland Park ISD. And I've actually been doing work in Highland Park ISD uh, for the last 10 years. And then I did a brief stint actually in 2006 when I, when I was just an intern. Well, I'm Diego Barrera. I'm a, a design architect uh, at Stantec, and um, I had the privilege of working on uh, a lot of the projects on in this bond, uh, including the elementary that we're going to look at today. Uh, but before we jump forward to that, uh, let's get back to that conversation about resiliency. 
when we talk about resiliency, we're really talking about being proactive and setting up measures for your building, for your facility to bounce back from any anticipated stress of disturbance, right? Uh, so that's fairly general. So what do we mean by that? So when, when an event happens, how do you get back to normal operating procedure and what, what, what processes are in place for that? We know that uh, the building plays a role in that, the infrastructure plays a role, but a much larger role is uh, the procedures of planning, the prevention that you have in place to make sure that when something happens, uh, the, the right things start to happen uh, to, to get back uh, into normal oper uh, operating procedure. But so when we talk about resiliency, uh, and we hear a lot about resiliency uh, nowadays, uh, what, what do we mean and what does that mean in the context of schools? We know that, that our facilities at schools uh, uh, face different types of threats, uh, and, and we can classify them as, as natural threats, but also as man-made threats. And, you know, we, we have a kind of a, a stark example of a natural threat here in Dallas just last year with the tornado that came by and, and destroyed uh, Cary Junior High School uh, in Dallas. So how do you prepare for this? Uh, can you build a building that would withstand the tornado? Well, maybe you could, but the the idea of being resilient is what happens when this happens? What are the plans in place so that you can move forward? We know that as far as natural threats go, that those are increasing every, uh, since uh, NOAA has been tracking this for, well, for many years, but the last 10 years, the increase has been, uh, has been huge in, in, in events and uh, um, and what they call weather events that cost more than a, a billion dollars. There's been more than uh, 18 in 2017 same for uh, 2018 and 19 and, and in 2020 we're on track. So what does that mean? That means that our buildings are going to have to be uh, prepared for these events and, 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 uh, and it might not be that example of a tornado in, uh, in, a, in a Dallas school, but it might be that you're replacing your roofs more often and, and having that consideration when you're planning new schools is important. It's also important to think about the fact that there's there's also man-made threats, right? And not all of them are, are, are people out to do harm to your students or to your facility. Some of them are, are basically accidents or, uh, you know, that happen due to poor planning. Having a fertilizer plant close to schools is probably not a great idea. But when, when those situations happen, that, that is a threat as well to your billing. And it's something that, that if discovered needs to be addressed. We do see a lot of, uh, uh, on the news, uh, in the past few years, we've seen a lot about active shooter and about uh, gun, gun violence in our schools. And although this is something that is, is, is important and that, that we need to address, we also know that the, the, the data shows that our, our students are, are really safe in school. That in fact, there is more likely that they face uh, uh, an event of violence in their way to school than there is on school. But regardless of that point, uh, making our schools safer for them is, is, is definitely a priority. Uh, but the violence in school uh, doesn't just come from those, those events that make the headlines. We know that there's bullying that happens, there's cyber bullying. So how does architecture, how do the spaces that we, uh, the, that we design for our students can, uh, can address some of these issues? Vandalism has been around for a long time and it will be around for a long time as well. So how do we make sure that as, as well, the, the spaces we design address uh, vandalism and theft and, and, and help minimize those, those instances. So, you know, the natural reaction would be to try to protect a school against every threat out there and just, just be safe. Let's just make it as safe as possible. But we know that it is cost prohibitive to do that. We can't build a building uh, that is, you know, up to the level of a U.S. Embassy so that no threat, uh, that, that most threats are minimized, right? You have budgets and you have priorities. And so having a process to go through those priorities and having uh, what we call a threat assessment process, there's many out there, uh, that helps you uh, target uh, your, your resources and, and, your, and your focus and your, and your energy towards the things that you need to address for that particular school, that particular project, uh, and that particular uh, age group. Um, so we're not going to go into depth on how to perform one of these, but we think that this is the first step before starting to address what are those safety measures that you have to take, what are those threats. And a good time to do that is as you reevaluate re your uh, multi-hazard operation plan that, uh, that every district keeps uh, and, up uh, and updates every five years. So when this process is going on, uh, 
tying in the facility needs and what what can be addressed uh, is, is this is a good uh, moment to do that and currently the the TEA uh, has proposed new rules that update the standards for facilities uh, for, for educational facilities so bringing that into that conversation when you're updating your uh, multi-hazard operation plan is important right the 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 aspects of the rules that change regarding um, school safety are, are pretty basic. And, and I would say, uh, having worked for, for a majority of the school district, having partnered with them uh, here in, the, in North Texas, most school districts are doing these things. So they're, they're, they're really just a starting point to move forward and, 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 to, and to make sure that, this, that, that school safety is top of mind when, when planning a new facility. Uh, and all of these things, as we plan to make safer schools, it's important to keep in mind that at the end, yes, we want to create a safe school, but it has to be a school. It has to be a place that's still inspiring for our students and that it's still a, a place where they can thrive and learn and, 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 and reach their best selves. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the context for how we plan for threats that are out there. And now we wanted to jump into a specific example that Vicky's going to show us uh, that's very pertinent to us about uh, uh, storm shelters here in, in North Texas. Great, thanks Diego. Yeah, so as we talk about safe and resilient schools, obviously one of the major talking points in this region is the inclusion of storm shelters. Um, as Diego noted, the threat is rare, but it is a very real threat in our region. Um, and this isn't gonna be an in-depth dive into all the various requirements that go into designing a successful shelter. Um, but what we do wanna talk about is how to plan for and locate these um, in our projects um, so that we provide safe spaces, but as Diego said that they are still inspiring and thoughtful for everyday use. Um, so as we're all aware, um, starting in the 2015 IBC, um, storm shelters are required in the 250 mile per hour wind zone, which is the dark blue that you're seeing on the screen. Um, and this covers um, most of, most of um, the DFW area. This is specific to e-occupancies, and it's also specific to tornado shelters. There is no reference right now to any need for, um, for hurricane shelters. Um, and as we talk about this, the IBC is the code that tells us that we are required to provide storm shelters or when we're required to do it. And then it's gonna reference the ICC 500 as kind of the how to do it. And so you'll hear that reference later on in the presentation. Um, and that's, that's, um, that's where some of those requirements come from. So, since shelters were first added to the building code requirements in 2015, there's been a lot of discussions and confusion into some of the wording of the code language. Um, and so luckily the 2018 IBC, it clarifies some of that for us, some of the questions that people had in determining when and how big these shelters need to be. So you can see, um, you can see the comparison of the language between the two on the screen. Now, one thing that is still always really tricky with these projects is the use of the language of occupant load. Um, for most of us, we think of occupant load in means of egress capacity, and we know that that's a very high capacity compared to the amount of people who are actually going to be in these schools and using them. Um, so this is a really important discussion to have um, and to have with your AHJs early on to make sure that we're all um, on the same page as to how big these are going to be. Um, the IBC actually includes commentary that specifies that it is not the intent necessarily to use egress code, but it's going to be the everyday use of the classrooms and the staff that's in the space. So again, this can make a really big difference as to how large your shelter needs to be. And it's just one of those conversations that as we're planning for shelters really needs to be a forefront of the conversation early on um, to make sure that we're, that we're doing it correctly. Um, we also know in K through 12, um, we do a lot of additions. And it was always very confusing based on the initial 2015 code. It didn't very specifically address what to do um, when you're doing an addition. Now, luckily, the 2018 IBC is going to clarify that for us. Um, you can see some of the wording on the screen from that code. And it's basically telling us some information that mirrors the new building requirement um, and helping us to understand when the shelter will be required for an addition. Um, so we're just going to walk through that really quickly. Um, you see on the left, you see just an existing building, your existing school. Um, on the right image is just a typical two classroom addition. Now what the code's telling us is if that two classroom addition has an occupant load of greater than 50, then it's needs, going to need to be a storm shelter. 
So as you get into some of all the, the nitty gritty requirements of the ICC, you know that if you do a storm shelter, you need to have sanitation facilities, you need to have support spaces, MEP, and other items. So that addition has to get a little bit big, bigger. Now, one thing to note, um, in this image, we're showing a large gang restroom. That's a design choice. That's not necessarily the amount of toilets that are required for the storm shelter. That's just a design choice that, again, needs to be discussed. The ICC can help you understand how many um, restrooms would be required strictly for a storm shelter or on your plumbing code requirements um, for the addition itself. And this two classroom addition with the support spaces can meet the requirement of the code. It can provide enough space for the amount of occupants in the addition. And that meets the intent and that would be fine. However, um, one thing to note is let's say you add two additional classrooms to that addition and that's what you're seeing right here. This storm shelter, this whole gray area then could house the entire school in that storm shelter. Um, so that's a really important thing to understand with clients is that by possibly if the if the budget is there for them, they could possibly um, use a little bit more and then meet their desire to provide a safe space for the entire school. It's also important to note that you couldn't build this addition and not make the entire addition a storm shelter. You have to get into the language that tells you if you're building an addition large enough to house the entire school, then that needs to be the shelter. So there's some really specific requirements in there um, and they're just really important to note and again to understand ahead of time um, what's going to be required. So um, we've been talking a little bit about both the capacity that's required for the shelter based on um, how large the school population is and then it also talks about the size of the shelter itself. So the size of the shelter um, is going to be a calculation from the ICC 500. You can see the table on the screen right now. For the most part, it's five square feet per person um, is how you start to figure how much space is gonna be needed. That's not a lot of space, um, but again, you're only required to have people in there for up to two hours and typically much less than that. So that's probably fine. Um, also note that when they're talking about square foot per person, they're talking about it in terms of usable, usable shelter floor area. So what exactly does that mean? So what it means is that the code knows that there's gonna be a lot of stuff in rooms. In addition to built in things like casework, there's gonna be furniture, there's gonna be equipment, there's gonna be a lot of items in that space. They're gonna affect how many people you can actually get in there. So what, so what the ICC lays out is basically um, a number of different ways that you can reduce your, or that you need to reduce your square footage to understand um, with the understanding of what's going to be in that space. This is somewhat subjective. You know, we kind of make our, our assumption as to a classroom might be the 35% reduction based on the amount of furniture in there. A gymnasium has a higher ratio, there's less stuff in there. But as a design team, um, along with conversations with your owner about how and what's gonna be in these spaces, it's an important conversation to have to right size your shelter. Um, you can see on this plan, we've got three different hatches um, that show some of the different usable space calculations we use to determine how big the shelter needs to be. Um, and again, it's just based on what's going to be in those rooms on a daily basis. Um, we included open space in the corridors in this example. However, in this example, we did not include restrooms. Now there's nothing in the code that says you cannot include them. However, again, it's a really important discussion to have with your owners. Do they want children um, sheltering next to a toilet and a urinal? Probably not, but maybe there's some really big cost or site restraints that will make that necessary. So just talk about it, make sure everyone's on the same page ahead of time um, and that you can have um, a right size shelter. Um, so obviously the next big question after you figure out, do you have to do it? How big does it need to be? Is where's the best place for it? So obviously there is no best place. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into what makes sense for each project. Um, there's also nothing that tells you that it has to be a single shelter like you see in some of these examples. You can have multiple shelters spread out throughout a space. Um, in some instances, depending on the overall layout and size of the facility and maybe the population of people um, in the school, this could make sense to get people as quickly as possible into shelters. Obviously, this duplicates a lot of structural, fire protection, mechanical requirements. So there's a cost increase to it. But again, in some instances, this might make the most sense. Um, so just think through all those variables. Um, so as we talk about location, this is the plan we saw earlier. 
This is using just a typical classroom wing as your shelter. You got MEP spaces included, you've got sanitation, um, you've got toilet rooms included. Um, so this works well. The classrooms for the most part on the inside, depending on how it's designed and on the outside can look like the rest of the building without too much difference. Um, so in this example, this was one of our earlier storm shelters. This was an addition to a school that had very large open windows. So we wanted to keep that look. And on the inside, we went in with storm shutters. Um, these are pretty, pretty large in the room. Um, also, due to the, the type of space this is, you're seeing that they're using the window sills for a lot of storage under the storm shelters. So in the end, maybe there was a better solution for this. Um, one option is we're seeing um, the cost of ICC 500 rated windows um, going down. And so in some instances, that might make more sense. There's some limitations to that um, size wise, but again, that could have made more sense. Um, but the good thing is in this classroom, you still have open windows, you still have lights, um, just possibly there was some other solutions um, to that. Um, so another great location for shelters could be the gym. Gyms are big open spaces by their nature. You don't have to do too much of a square footage reduction for them. Um, they already typically have uh, less openings than other areas in the school. Um, Typically, they're already going to be CMU construction, so you already have some basis for the hardened structure that's required for it. Um, so they can be really successful shelters. Um, these images that you're seeing on the screen are recent storm shelter. Outside and inside, it really doesn't look much different than anything else you would see for a gym. Um, on this bottom right-hand image, you see a large storm shutter on a double door. That's really the only thing in this gym that tells you that this is different somehow. Otherwise, this is a really bright, really, really typical, um, really typical gym for its users. Um, this is an interesting example because this is actually showing a storm shelter. What you see is you see a lot of glazing in this image. You see corners that are highly glazed. You see windows around the perimeter, but this is actually showing a storm shelter. So in plan, you can see the design team got a little bit creative with the perimeter of the storm shelter and they were able to kind of pull it back from some glazed corners. Um, to bring light into the space to keep an aesthetic on the exterior that allowed for some really great design solutions. But also once you go into it as a shelter, you close up your doors, you're now in a hardened space for that particular use. But in every day, you've got some really great inspiring spaces in there. Um, shelters can be two stories. Um, this is an example of a shelter we did that was a two-story space. It was a two-story school, so that was a really great option to provide quick, easy access for people on both levels of the school into the shelter. Um, it had a large shop space on the first floor, which had some open space in it. It had limited windows um, already based on its use, so it made a lot of sense to use this as a shelter. It had some classroom space to provide additional space for students. It also had a communicating stair, which allowed staff really good access between both levels so that they could keep an eye on kids everywhere and really have a good feel for what was going on um, in the entire shelter very easily. Um, so this was a really great solution for that project. Um, we've also seen sub-level um, shelters, which can make sense um, in the right condition. The example you're seeing on the screen was an existing school with an existing basement um, that got expanded into, um, and we expanded then the basement as well as the rest of the school. Um, and we were able to use that basement space of classrooms and locker rooms, et cetera, as the storm shelter. Um, when you think of underground spaces, um, there's not, not going to be really any openings in there that you have to worry about, or very few at least. Um, so that allows you to use the inherent nature of that space to your advantage. Um, here you can see these top two images are from that. You really don't see much difference. You see a storm shelter at the, or a storm shutter um, at the end of a hallway that tells you, okay, something's happening here. But other than that, it's gonna look like a basement space most likely would have otherwise looked and keeps some bright open spaces um, on the floors above, which was really successful. Um, additionally, in some instances where we've been doing um, below grade parking due to site constraints, um, kind of similar to what you're gonna see on, on Boone here was, um, a couple of projects that had smaller sites. So we were already planning to do below grade parking. Um, 
So it made a lot of sense then to use that below grade parking with its concrete walls, obviously very few openings um, as our shelter space. Um, it provided a lot of open space and drive aisles, um, a lot of really good visibility to see everyone in that space and it made some really, it was a real, some really good decisions for these schools. One thing to note for these sub-level parking garages is you really technically don't have to have plumbed restrooms. We use the exception to provide um, chemical toilets. Um, in our below grade parking garages so that we didn't have to extend um, plumbing um, facilities, uh, restroom facilities into, um, into the parking garages. And so that worked again really well, um, really well um, for, these, for these projects. Um, and with that, as we go back into um, um, understanding uh, some other important uh, design aspects for safety in schools. Just remember there's a lot of other thoughts and considerations that go into storm shelters um, beyond the initial planning. Um, but again, using these smart planning choices and knowing what makes sense for your school um, can really get you off on the right foot. Thanks, Vicki. So we wanted to also jump into a conversation about keeping um, to school buildings safe from other types of threats. So I think the natural threat, uh, the one that's very prevalent and, and very, uh, that plays a big role in, in new construction here is, is sort of uh, doing the storm shelters and preparing for that. So what other, uh, we, we talked about those man-made threats and how we can approach those in a school campus. You know, one, one, one lens to look at how to plan for a school that's safe for our students is to, to use the septic principles, uh, which are these four. Um, and, and really to focus on these three, they're easy to remember SATs, we all took the SATs, but surveillance axis and territoriality as, as, as tactics to, or, or, or strategies to design spaces that are safe for our students. So I will, uh, I will talk about each one of these and, and really what, uh, what these mean specifically for a school building. So when we talk about natural surveillance, really what we're talking about is the ability to see as much of the space without taking extra measures. Um, so what that means is that from where I'm sitting as a principal or, from, uh, or as a receptionist or as a teacher in the teacher lounge, I can see as much of the school without having to take extra steps. It's great to have cameras and that helps a lot uh, to, to monitor the building, but it's much easier if, if there's that direct line of sight. Um, and so when we talk about uh, what, that, what impact that has in a facility, sometimes we, we talk about transparency and visibility as, as a potential uh, 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 you know, threat or as a potential uh, weakness in a design, but in in day-to-day -day use having that that visibility and and that transparency helps make that space outside of the school or you know in this instance this this green space outside uh feel like it's not uh it's, it's not no man's land there's there's visibility there and when it's in use you know that 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 there is an expectation there because that the, there are there are folks monitoring uh that space we know that when we create this transparency for, for, uh, for natural surveillance, it's important that not only it works on day one, but it works throughout the life of this facility. So maintenance plays a big role. So, you know, whether it's in the exterior where the landscape, it, it's kept, you know, trimmed so that th those views are, are maintained or in the interior where, where your glass walls don't become, uh, you know, pinup boards where, you know, you have uh, all sorts of other things that go on those walls and, and, and change that, uh, that usability there. Um, and this is uh, especially important in, in places where we know there tends to be trouble, right? So we know that uh, uh, stairwells and corridors are are normal places where we're bullying and and uh, basically uh, some behavior problems happen. So let's make those instead of you know this this tight corridor in the corner of the building or the stair that is basically all walls and 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 nobody can see into to it. Let's bring those spaces to the core of the building so that they can be easily monitored and, and, and create that expectation on the students. As our buildings become bigger, it's also harder to make sure that the exterior of the buildings avoid those blank facades where you know they can invite graffiti, but there can also be corners where it feels like nobody can see what's going on there. And so it, it invites you know, illicit activity. So it's, it's important to have those com considerations in mind as, as, we, uh, as we design the buildings and, and design the access around them. 
you know, that, that third strategy is access control and, and natural access control is, is sort of the strategy of directing people, uh, 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 directing the traffic uh, to, to, to get them away from uh, a target uh, of crime, crime opportunities, right? So basically, make sure that the people that move around your building are going to where you want them to go through your, to your ent entry and that you're denying access to the places where, where harm can happen to your facility. So this is a, an extreme example, right? So if, you know, if, if I'm driving by here and I really want to steal that guy's TV, I really have to think hard about that. I'm probably going to move on that down the road and, and find an easier target. This is not what we mean in schools. What we mean is, you know, you don't want a building that I arrive and I don't know where I am and I have to walk all around the building. It makes it hard for me as a user to know where to come into your building, but it also makes it hard for you to know whether me, I'm the parent that's really, really trying to find a way to get into the building or somebody that's, that's there for an illicit purpose. So if we have clear entrances and clear, 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 clear design that gets you to the entry, I think that helps in, in, that, uh, in, in that realm. We're also having visibility to those entrances. We know that as people approach our building, we want the reception to be able to see people before they're inside of the doors, before they're in the vestibule, uh, but also from other places in the building. And the ability to compartmentalize the building once once visitors are in the building to be able to separate those wings so that that if there is an event uh, or you know if you're uh, an, on their luck, lockdown for any uh, reason you can separate those uh, those areas of the building and then uh, you know kind of. Uh, keep that event in, in one uh, area of the building. And it also helps for after hours, right? So if you want to uh, have your community after hours, you can use sort of those public areas and invite uh, and keep those, uh, you know, those academic wings or other places off, off limits for folks. The typical entry in, in our schools is during drop off students come in freely through the front doors. These are uh, at that time, you're going to have all the teachers out there. So we're going to see who's coming into the building. But once that drop off time or window closes, we want those doors to be closed. We want uh, to divert all the traffic into our uh, into our reception and until folks uh, check in in there, will they be granted uh, uh, access into the building? Uh, I think most of our schools here in Texas uh, uh, do a version of this. We're seeing folks move away from this and even go beyond to where you're not allowed access into the reception itself. There'll be a transaction window or something in that vestibule, in that security vestibule, where you will check in and then uh, after you clear, you know, what most people use the Raptor system, a after that point, you will be granted access into the building. Different strategies, but really the, the goal is the same, is to make sure that before folks are into the building, you, you know who's there and, and, and what, uh, you know, what are they doing there. Um, by territorial reinforcement, we really mean sort of creating a, a, a sphere of influence around your building. And, and I think the best way to describe this is, uh, you know, think of your front lawn. Uh, I think there's a sphere of influence in, in your front lawn. You might not have a big gate or a big fence or even a white picket fence. It might just be grass beyond the, the sidewalk, but I'm not gonna show up to your house and have a picnic in your front lawn because I know that I don't belong there. I know that that's probably not a space for me to do that. I probably should move to the park down the street. Uh, so we can use similar strategies when we design schools to make sure that that sphere of influence is clear. So folks know that, uh, you know, that, that certain parts of the campus is, are, are for student use and others might be used for communities. And this is important in school buildings because they are community buildings after all, right? Uh, these are, uh, may, for, for many of us, uh, our school playground is our, our, our kids uh, park in the weekends or, or after hours they go and, and still play in that area. Uh, because it's within walking distance of your house. So making sure we, 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 we make it clear which areas are free to access and which areas are, are, are probably just for the students is important. And we create that, uh, we don't have to do it with, with fences and gates, we can do it with the architecture. So for example, in this, uh, in this example we're seeing here, I think you know that if you go up the steps, you're basically going to the school. This is not part of the park. The, the, the public edge of uh, or the, or the public part of the site is in the sidewalk. Beyond that, you, you're, you're starting to get into the school property. And this is reinforced by the fact that uh, this, this building welcomes you, but it also provides a lot of visibility uh, to that entry procession. And, and this idea of, uh, you know, the, the, 
the site helps us a little bit because of the way uh, the, 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 uh, the landscaping works and the way the, the topography works. But we have this clear edge and these, these uh, built-in uh, benches, the stone benches help many, in many ways, right? They're where the students wait for their parents, but they also clear a clear uh, separation from that entry procession. Uh, it's also very clear where you're going, right? So when, once you're approaching that building, you know that that's the, the main entry and that's where you're directed. And, and that's sort of back to that example we were talking about earlier. We also want to prevent a vehicular intrusion uh, as much as possible. And this example is very clear. The site was helping as the topography. It's taller. It's really, really hard to drive out the, uh, up there. Uh, but in a site where, where it's flat, it, it, we might have to think of other strategies. Bollards work okay. They're not the prettiest. So how do we uh, make sure that these are integrated into the design and they seem more purposeful? Uh, for for the, uh, the the seem more purposeful and they add to the design, not really be a, a detractor. So that's that's a consideration that, that we keep in mind. So these three SATs are tied together by this idea of maintenance, right? Where the SATs we address during design maintenance is sort of uh, th that follows through through the life of the project. And what's important there is that we know that if if there's no maintenance in a space, if a space looks like uh, it's not taken care of, it implies that nobody cares what happens there. And so it, it invites, uh, you know, it, it, it invites uh, random acts of, of, uh, of violence or, or, or of theft, of vandalism. So it's better to remove it. If you have something that it's always broken, it's better to remove it than, than, than to just leave it there uh, as an example, right? And this comes from this idea or this theory of the broken windows that, you know, signs of disorder invite more disorder. Uh, so, so the maintenance plays a huge role and for us as designers of buildings, it's important that we part that, that in that conversation when we're partnering with our clients, with our ISD clients, we provide materials that uh, are easily maintained, that that they can serve our students well, and that they hold up really well to the to to the uses and sometimes abuses of our students, uh, so that uh, so that they're they they can they can perform. Uh, as they're intended. So this idea is that these three together, or, or these four, surveillance, access, territoriality, and maintenance work to create a, a safer environment uh, for our students. So that was the very quick uh, run through those. Now we wanted to save some time at the end so that we could give you, and I think we have about 10 minutes left, uh, we could give you a tour of uh, Boone Elementary. So just to give everybody a little background before we get into the tour of Boone Elementary. So Boone Elementary was the first new elementary school in Highland Park ISD in uh, 50 years about. Um, and it was part of a bond that was $360 million, uh, the largest bond in the history of Highland Park ISD. Um, it represented about $300 million, $300 million worth of construction. Uh, and it was really revolving around the new elementary school, Boone, um, the replacement of three existing elementary schools, more on that in a minute, um, renovations to the smaller elementary school. Uh, that elementary school is actually only on a 2.1 acre site. So not a lot of uh, efficiency we could get out of that, get out of that building that it's not already getting. Um, and then additions and renovations to the middle school, the high, sm the high school, replacement of an indoor tennis building. Yes, they have an indoor tennis building. Yes, it makes them a lot of money. So it's really important to them. Um, and the replacement of the indoor pool facility, which was old, located in the old high school. It was actually the old uh, girls gym because girls and boys had separate gyms way back then. Um, they had uh, dug out the floor, put in some wood pilings and it sunk down the pool uh, in an old gym. Kind of an interesting little feat. That was, I think that was done in the 50s. Um, and, and as part of this, you know, the, we, we started the bond planning. We worked on the whole bond with them um, starting in 2012. Late 2012 is really when we started engaging in bond planning. And that lasted all the way through the summer of 2015. Um, and relative to the elementary schools, it, you know, the ultimate decision to tear down those elementary schools, uh, there were two built in the 1920s and then one built uh, in, the, in the 1950s uh, by, by uh, Mark Lemon. Um, you know, it was really difficult for them, um, but they had a bond committee create, you know, a, about 24 people of parents, um, city council members, town council members, um, and, and just kind of local developer um, um, professional uh, leaders. Uh, and, and when we started looking at the different ways to add on to those buildings or do partial demolitions and, and try and salvage some of the older parts of the building or, you know, recreate it. It just, it became a little bit of a mess for them. Um, those buildings have been added on to, you know, ever since they were built, you know, some of them four or five, six times. Uh, and so each time that happened, 
they just took away more of the green space on those small sites. Um, you know, most of those sites are under five acres, so they don't have a lot of space to deal with anyway. Um, so they just kept seeing those green spaces shrink and shrink and shrink. And I mean, when you think about the park cities, right, as they're called, um, you know, the more you get rid of parks, the less they become the park cities, right? Um, so that really kind of pushed them over the edge. That and, you know, those old, those old elementary schools were old concrete frame structures. So really rigid footprints that you were not going to get more square footage out of those classrooms. Um, I mean, they had counselors uh, taking care of kids literally out of broom closets. Um, and I mean, literally the sign on the wall said broom closet because they used to be broom closets in the 20s. Um, so it, it really kind of led them to, to, to make that decision to tear those elementary schools down. And so we used Boone as the float school. So one elementary school would leave, go to Boone, and then come back out into the new facility and cycle that through um, as we built those new elementary schools over a 14 month time span, which is, which is pretty impressive to demolish and build a brand new building with an underground parking garage um, um, in 14 months. Uh, obviously the underground parking garages, all the teachers, there's, there's no parking on any of these tiny sites. The teachers were all parking in the neighborhoods, which obviously doesn't make um, neighbors happy. Um, so, so that kind of led to that. Um, at Boone Elementary School was an interesting site. Let me think here. So the, sorry get control here. There we go. So some of the imagery you see um, from the multi-use, the multi-use building, which actually had a lot of professional development space. We merged professional development space, baseball locker rooms, and a pool into one building, um, which is a little bit of the Swiss Army knife of the school district, it seems like. Um, and then affected all the elementary school campuses and, and did some interesting things at the high school with, um, with a program called MAPS um, that, that uh, the Moody's actually helped um, donate for. But getting back to Boone, um, Boone is on a, a 4.7 acre site. It's pretty compact. Uh, there is 16 feet of, I think there's 16 feet of fall from Northwest Highway uh, down to the residential street. Uh, this image, Northwest Highway is on the right or, or Northwest Parkway in particular is what you can see. And so one of the biggest challenges in this building was about making sure that, that from the, the academic pods that you see on the left side of the image, all the way out to the play fields, the cafeteria and the gym on the right side of the image, um, there really, you really didn't have to take an elevator to get there from the first floor because the sped kids were on the first floor and the kindergartners are on the first floor and wanted to make sure their travel was about as easy as possible. So again, just looking at this, the, the underground parking garage was buried into the higher slope of the site. There's a good section that kind of shows you how that works. But in this image, blue classrooms on the left, red um, administration in the middle, uh, and then on the right, music, fine arts, all the loud spaces that normally get accompanied together. Um, second floor, you just po the pods repeat up as they go up the floors. Second floor library, really intentional, right? Getting that library as close to every student and grade as they can in the middle of the building. And then third floor, pure classroom pods. Uh, so this is what I was talking about, that, that slight, the site um, section. Uh, so that entry on the left and then on the right is, uh, is Northwest Highway. So really making sure that the slope of those floors is subtle enough that all those kids can get from their classroom pod to um, the kitchen and dining and gym that they're going to every single day in music and art without having to take an elevator or navigate stairs was, uh, was pretty critical. Uh, and so this just an overall view of the site. So that it kind of center right side of the image there, you see the parking garage entry. It, it's actually really nice. It enters in almost that grade as the street slopes down at that uh, pretty severe slope. And we have a, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so yeah, we wanted to jump from there. The, the principal was kind enough to do an introduction before we do the, the, the virtual tour. So let's, let's hear that. Uh, crank up your volume a little bit because it's a little low. My name is Amanda Reyes, and I'm the principal at Michael M. Boone Elementary School in Highland Park ISD. Our building was built three years ago to serve as a swing school that would house other elementary schools in our district while their buildings were being rebuilt from the ground up. Ultimately, the plan for our building was for it to become the fifth elementary school in Highland Park once the other school's buildings were complete. We are thrilled uh, this year to have opened our doors as Boone Elementary, the first elementary school to open in Highland Park in more than 70 years. Our building is beautiful, modern, and full of wonderful features that add to our learning environment each day. One of our favorite features of this building is the light. There is not a single area that doesn't get flooded with light throughout the day. All of our classrooms have windows that bring in natural light, and we like that uh, that it contributes to a very positive teaching and learning experience. In addition, we have flexible learning spaces throughout the building. 
Each grade level pod consists of a flex space surrounded by classrooms. We also have flex spaces throughout each of the three levels of our building, which allows our teachers to be innovative as to where and how they deliver their instruction. As we all know, COVID has added a new layer to how we structure our instructional days. The many flexible spaces we have, which are also flooded with light, allow teachers to take their classes to new spaces while letting students spread out and socially distance. Some of our other favorite features include our outdoor learning spaces. Teachers have the freedom to take students outside for instruction while combining that with mask breaks that we want to offer our students this year. We have several lawn spaces around our building as well as dedicated spaces that were built with stone and concrete seating for students. Our cafeteria is very large and has afforded us the ability to seat an entire grade level, two to three socially distanced students at each table, which assists us with keeping cohorts of students safely together. If you ask a teacher, she might say her favorite feature in our school is the underground parking. Parking spaces in the Park Cities is very limited, so we are grateful for the design team that thought about adding the garage under our school. Thank you so much for letting us participate in your meeting. We are happy to be able to share all the wonderful spaces in our school and how they make our teaching and learning experiences the best they can be. So with that, we, we just want to walk you through the school very quickly. We know we have about three minutes, really, so we, we'd have time to close. Uh, this, is, this is a virtual tour. It's Think of it as a street view of, uh, or you know, a Google street view, if you will, of the building. We use these for virtual tours for our clients, especially nowadays. It's hard, you know, to... Uh, you know, to take a client that's, that's thinking about a new school uh, to visit uh, an existing school. So these are very helpful and, and sort of uh, the best thing that we could come up with in lieu of being in person. So, you know, we, we, we've looked at the entry a little bit of, of how that works and, and the siding. And I'm just kind of sort of going to jump into a couple of spaces here. Um, as you come in, uh, the library is right on top, so you can see that the entry sequence is much like we were talking about earlier. You have to check in and then you go in and then you jump into uh, some of these spaces. Um, because the school, uh, the, the way it's set up three, three stories is you have special, uh, uh, special education wing down here. Uh, K uh, on this side and then on the first floor, on the second floor, you have first grade and second grade, and then third and fourth. Their, their fifth grade is in their intermediate school. Uh, so each one of their pods, right, they're set up in pods, has a, uh, an, a, a flexible area. The, the kinder one is smaller, uh, as you can see here. Uh, but these classrooms, they can expand out uh, into, into this space and, and sort of uh, have a little bit of extra space into the classroom. And it was important, you know, a lot of this shape of, of having seven little classrooms around a, a, a flexible area, this shape is really trying to maximize the, the, the ability to have natural light in each one of these spaces. So I wanted to show you uh, this one, but also jump into the first floor uh, one as well, or the, 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 the uh, second grade one, as these are a little bit bigger because those classrooms are smaller, so the, the flexible area gets, gets bigger. And, and so each one has, has storage. This is before we have a, uh, there's a white wo uh, whiteboard here with a, uh, with a projector and, and, and all of them was in there. Well, the projector right here, the whiteboard's what's missing. Uh, well, this one has a screen. We did this five, four times, remember, so it, it kept changing a little bit. So I don't remember all of them. Uh, but this this was the idea. The idea is that, you know, eat, all of these classrooms have visibility into the space so the teachers feel comfortable uh, sending their students out here. I think thinking Brad of, mentioned. Yeah, yeah, thinking about resiliency, though, these pods were also, dis I mean, you see that the pods are kind of separated from that main corridor. They don't have a lot of view to that main corridor, and that was intentional. Um, there's actually roll-up uh, doors that, that, that prevent access into those pods during emergencies. So they hit the panic button for the school. It drops those doors. The teachers are the only ones that have key access to open or close them. Um, so they actually wanted that separation for security, but also for visual purposes. They really wanted the kids to feel like when they were in their pod, that they were in their own little world and that kids walking back and forth to the bathroom or to the dining hall or whatever weren't going to to really kind of get in their flow. 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I would love to show you every little space, but I think we're, we're a little bit tight on time. So we're going to uh, end here and thank you for the, for spending time with us and, and, and touring this school with us. We're really proud of it. And we're really happy that, uh, that these good, the students are enjoying the space and, and liking it. And, and so if you have any questions, we'd be glad to take them right now. Uh, and now we'll pass it to, uh, to Ann. Well, thank you so much uh, to Stantec for this virtual tour and program. Learned a lot. Appreciate it. Appreciate the extra effort you put into making it virtual. Wanted to let everyone know that it is being recorded, so it will be available online on our webpage for you. And you also um, will be receiving the AIA uh, continuing education learning units for this. So um, added bonus for the, the architects. And it looks like we have some questions. So construction and, cost, yeah. construction cost was right at about 30 million. The parking garage cost kind of got us. Hmm. Any more questions from the group? Oh. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see you at the golf tournament. Bye-bye.